Sir Roger Bannister, R.I.P. Your race is run. It will have gone by fast, just like you, though you lived 88 years. But your achievement will go the distance. You will never be forgotten. For younger listeners, the name Roger Bannister may not have the resonance that it has for someone of my age. Roger Bannister was a great Briton that we could all be proud of. The achievement of breaking the four-minute mile record was a phenomenon of its time and lasted for a very long time and even now has not been uh, particularly markedly improved on. So, here's my message, one of many I shall deliver today, to uh, Theresa May and the British government and to the Crown. First of all, Sir Roger Bannister should have been Lord Roger Bannister. If Sebastian Coe can be in the House of Lords, a man of lesser achievement, though truer blue politics, then why wasn't Sir Roger made a lord? But even posthumously, it's not too late for the state to properly honour him. He needs a proper send-off, maybe a mile, with Mo Farah running in front of the hearse. Here's one suggestion. What about yours? How do you think we should mark the passing of the great man who died today, aged 88? Sir Roger Bannister, your race is run. Now, we'll be talking about fascism in the next three hours. Why, you may ask. Well, first of all, the neo-Nazi party in Germany is now, from today, the official opposition in the Reichstag. What could possibly go wrong? How did this happen? Because the idiot Blairites in the SPD, the German equivalent of the Labour Party, have just voted 66%. Two-thirds, two-thirds, the idiots, voted to form a Labour Tory coalition government in Germany. Again, I ask, what could possibly go wrong? Imagine Jeremy Corbyn forming a coalition government with Theresa May. Imagine what could possibly go wrong. Well, one of the things that could go wrong is that when nothing gets better, as I promise you in Germany, it will not. Who will be the beneficiaries, qui bono, of this move? Well, you don't have to look in the crystal ball. You can read it in the book, in the newspapers. That leaves the AFD, the Alliance for Deutschland, as the official opposition in the state. So everything that goes wrong in this Labour, Tory, hybrid monster government, who will pick up the dripping roast of political benefit. Every time there's too many immigrants, too many refugees, crimes committed, factories closing, businesses going bust, unemployment rising, is any of this ringing a bell with you, dear listeners? The neo-Nazi party will get bigger and stronger every day, until the day comes when they might inherit the state, albeit as a minority government. Does that ring any bells? Because that's happened in Germany before. The SBD just signed its own death warrant today. It has entered death row. It will be quietly, slowly perhaps, put to sleep by being in bed with Angela Merkel, a deeply unpopular, gone on far too long, German Chancellor. Why might that be of interest? Well, if you're Dunsertan Ash, if you've seen Dunkirk, if you've seen Darkest Hour, just two of the magnificent films 
featuring in the Oscars later this evening, you'll know what could go wrong. There's an election today in Italy where the right or the far right are very likely to prevail. And a certain Benito Mussolini is back, back on the scene in Italian politics. His picture, his image, his icon, Italian fascism in different guises, is back in Italy. Again, I ask you what could possibly go wrong. Unless you think that Britain is somehow immune from these things. It's true that we have a particular relationship to fascism. If it wasn't for us, dear Mr. Roosevelt, if it wasn't for us, it would have triumphed. And I'd be speaking to you now in German, although I wouldn't be, because I'd already have been long ago dead, along with the rest of those that German fascism called Untermensch, subhumans. Now, that doesn't mean we didn't have fascists in Britain at the time. We had many of them, the preeminent of whom was somebody called Sir Ed, Sir Mosley. Sir Mosley has a son called Max Mosley. Mosley is the benefactor of the deputy leader of the Labour Party to the tune of half a million pounds. We'll be asking about the British far right. Oswald Mosley may have gone, long gone. Max Mosley may have renounced, though not quite, the ideas of his father. But the far right is alive, kicking, stabbing, shooting, bombing, and planning mass murder and mayhem in Britain. How do I know this? Well, I've just made a film about it called The Patriot Games, which goes out on television this week. And I'll be talking to Ron Mackay, the director of The Patriot Games, in the first hour, indeed, very shortly, indeed, about what we found when we investigated the British far right. And we'll be talking about the Tories in turmoil. Gavin Barwell apparently blames Boris Johnson for him losing his seat. Never mind, he lost his seat and went into number 10 as a right-hand man of the Prime Minister Theresa May. But he hates Boris Johnson and he hates Brexit. That's why he leaked, as is now clear, and emblazoned across many pages in the Mail on Sunday, a damaging memo, an internal government memo that the Foreign Secretary sent the Prime Minister. What kind of government do we have in Britain where the Foreign Secretary cannot send a private communication to the Prime Minister without for internal party, partisan purposes? The chief aides of the Prime Minister don't leak it to the press. We'll be talking about the Tories in turmoil. We'll also be talking to the eminent Sir Vince Cable, MP again for Twickenham, leader of the Liberal Democrats, and when he used to regularly appear on my talk sports show, I used to describe him then as the best chancellor Britain never had. I've kind of reviewed my point of view on that, but I still respect him and hold him in uh, high regard. And he's going to be talking about the 30-year anniversary of the foundation of the Liberal Democrats. That went by faster than a Roger Bannister mile. 30 years. Unbelievable. I remember when it was happening. David Owen didn't want it. Stood out alone with the SDP. How did that go? <laughs> Where are they now? The Liberal Democrats is 30 years old and Sir Vince Cable will be talking to me about that, as well as about their plan to have a Liberal Democrat version of Momentum, about which do more later. This Momentum seeks to stop Brexit, and Vince Cable 
uh, will have, I'm sure, plenty to say about that. We'll be talking to Caroline Frost, the eminent, indeed preeminent in my view, entertainment journalist and author about the Oscar 2018 nominations. I'm at a slight disadvantage in that I only really know two of the films that are in for it. Uh, but I'm not at a disadvantage when I say that both of them would win the Oscar in any normal year before any normal panel of judges. Dunkirk was such a phenomenal film that I sat silently in the cinema, having earlier had to dab my eyes of excess moisture, dear listener, having been profoundly moved by it. And if I was profoundly moved by it, you can just imagine how I felt about the other of the Oscar nominees, Darkest Hour and Gary Oldman's supreme performance as Sir Winston Churchill. It was our finest hour and it followed immediately our darkest hour. Our darkest hour was when the mainland European states were collapsing like a cheap tent in front of the advance of the German tanks. In case you think I'm fixated on this, I've got to tell you that Raus and Schnell and Achtung never sound like music in my ears. It's one of the reasons I don't really care for the junkers of this world lecturing us, ordering us, threatening us in the Brexit negotiations. Neither do I take very kindly to the leaders of countries that folded like cheap tents in front of the Wehrmacht's advance, because that left our men at Dunkirk hopelessly exposed and but for the grace of God and the genius of Churchill and the flotilla of little ships which rescued them would have meant that we were left with no army at all in the face of an apparently imminent invasion by the Nazis just 20 miles away at the Channel ports. Both of these films are profoundly brilliant. I saw one of them more recently, so it's more sharply in my mind. Sir Winston Churchill was a very considerable criminal. He committed very considerable crimes against the peoples of what were called the Empire. He committed very considerable crimes against the Irish people from which I come against the Scottish working class from which I come, against the Welsh working class and the miners' union in particular, of which I am historically profoundly associated as an honorary member of the National Union of Mine Workers, South Wales area, Mardi Lodge. But without Sir Winston Churchill, I'd be speaking to you in German. Because in that hour, and this film brings it so profoundly to life, surrounded by traitors and fifth columnists who wanted to surrender to Nazi rule, either through defeatism or through actual ideological sympathy and affinity, they were ready to deliver us trust up like a chicken to Adolf Hitler. But Churchill's genius was not just to see that the only path of honour was to resist, but had the words, had the facility with the English language and the voice with which to express it. As the arch-traitor Halifax put it in the film, he has mobilised the English language and sent it into battle, and so he did. And in that battle, we prevailed. We didn't win the war. Russia won the war. We could never have won the war. But without us, there would have been no war to win, because Hitler would already have won it. It's George Galloway. I'm here for the next three hours. It's the mother of all talk shows.